Um, I had this uh, great supervisor when I was on internship at Monroe Meyer named Bill Wurzak. And he used to say, when we work with kids, we need a lot of carrots and just a few sticks. <laughs> And, and so the consequences are what I think of as the sticks, right? We always want to try to have more carrots, but we're going to need to have some consequences in our tool bag as well. The consequences are what makes the contrast. So um, when you get it right, something really cool happens. When you get it wrong, something not so fun happens. Consequences should be immediate. They should be implemented in a matter-of-fact manner without judgment, without negativity, um, and they should be appropriate for age. Um, loss of points, if you're doing a token system, a timeout if you're dealing with younger kids. Um, loss of points on a chart can be an immediate consequence. Some classrooms do pulling of tickets for problem behavior, right? Um, loss of the final ticket can eliminate choice time or it can eliminate recess time. And it's important that the loss of points be reserved for the most important targeted behaviors so that kids aren't losing points all day long. Those are just for the big, um, big deal behaviors. How do you feel about timeout? For or against? And I, and I don't necessarily mean in your middle school classrooms. I'm just, you know, philosophically. Those of you who are uh, timeout fans, okay? Those of you who are not? Those of you who are morally opposed or... Okay. A lot of you abstainers. What's that all about? <laughs> okay. Because I think the word time out is so negative now. So time away or time to relax or... Okay. Um, and, and maybe that is it. It's become kind of a semantic issue. I love me a time out. I think time outs are awesome and here's why. Time outs are brief. They are non-traumatic. They are immediate. Um, and you can do them as often as you need to and wherever you need to without harming a child. So you can provide teaching opportunities all the time everywhere if you do it right without hurting, without hurting a child. And there is, you know, a while back I saw this program. This gets into a whole philosophy of discipline thing, but I saw this program on TV a while back where they interviewed parents who had different discipline strategies. And they interviewed a family who believed strongly in corporal punishment and they used um, spankings with a belt on a regular basis and they interviewed a family who did kind of time out sorts of loss of privileges and they did a f interviewed a family that um, practiced what they called positive parenting and the way that they described positive parenting is an absolute lack of consequences and what they said is this they parented exclusively by positive attention they said we do not feel that it's necessary for our children to feel bad in order to behave better. So they refuse to do any kind of consequences. What's the problem <laughs> with that approach? <laughs> the rest of the world just doesn't work that way, right? So we are teaching our kids to have an expectation that is not going to be carried out. There ain't nobody else in that child's life who is going to let them go consequence free from the state patrol to their bosses. It's just not going to happen. So timeouts, I, I think, are, 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 are pretty handy. Um, and a timeout is essentially this. But here's the thing. I suspect that if I surveyed all of you and we talked about timeouts, we're talking about different things. We're talking about different animals because everybody implements a timeout slightly different. A what a timeout should be, what it's intended to be, is simply a removal of attention and removal of access to fun activities for a brief time as a consequence for a problem behavior. It's not a punishment. It's a teaching tool. This is the contrast, right? This is what happens when you get it right, and this is what happens when you get it wrong. So when you get it right, you're getting positive attention and you're getting frequently attended to, and when you get it wrong, you're sitting in timeout and nobody's paying attention to you. You don't have your fun stuff for five minutes and that sucks. That's the contrast. Um, <clears throat> verbal teaching isn't enough, and this is a very black and white environmental contrast. How should you do timeouts? People, timeouts can be done anywhere. People will tell you. You should do timeout for how long? A minute per year. Oh, that's the chorus. A minute per year of age. Not true. That is not based on any research anywhere that I can identify. Um, it does not have to be that long to be effective. And for most kids, guess what? That's too long. And especially kids who are impulsive or kids with ADHD. Timeout does not need to be anywhere near that long to be effective. Okay? Timeouts can be done anywhere. 
You can do it in a chair if you so desire. You can do it in a corner. You can do it in a designated room. It doesn't matter. Short and consistent is better than longer. The important, the only important aspects are removing attention and access to fun activities while the timeout's in play. So you'll hear parents say over and over, ah, oh, I tried timeout and it didn't work. And you'll talk to them about timeout and it turns out that their idea of timeout is that the child needs to be thinking about their behavior <laughs> while they're in timeout. And so to make sure that that happened, they would sit and talk to the child and process through the bad behavior while the timeout was occurring. And that's not timeout. That's one-on-one -on -one high intensity attention for a problem behavior. That's a whole different deal. Um, so similarly, you'll have parents who won't do that, but they also will respond and correct annoying behavior that happens in timeout. So they're not sitting there and talking to them, but every time Jimmy kicks the wall, Jimmy, stop kicking the wall, your timeout's gonna be longer. I'm gonna add a minute, quit that, knock that up. Okay, move away from there. Okay, you get back in that spot right now. <laughs> Same deal, right? That's a steady dose of attention, and the child is not in timeout while that's occurring. So when I teach timeout to parents, I say this, brief timeout in a spot, approximate the spot you want the child's bottom to remain within. And as long as the child's spot, bottom remains approximately within that spot, you're gonna ignore them. And if they kick the wall, you're gonna ignore it. If they're unsafe, you address that and you make them safe, but in a very matter of fact, low attention way. If their bottom completely leaves the area, you matter of factly return their bottom to that area but you do that without undue attention and with the absolute minimum of talking. Your job is not to process with them why they're there. You can't control what they're thinking about while they're sitting there and you don't need to for timeout to be effective. The other thing is that many parents feel like their child has to be silent in timeout for it to work. And so if their child talks or makes noise or cries, they'll extend the time. There's no research that says that they have to be quiet while they're in timeout for it to be effective. Because no matter what they're doing, if you're not attending to it, the goals are met, right? They, they, they're, they have reduced attention and reduced access, access to fun stuff. So these are the myths. With younger kids, timeout can be a good choice for aggressive behaviors or even sometimes noncompliance. So t t parents who are trying to get a handle on noncompliance before their kids get too big, we will sometimes use it as a teaching tool in compliance training. So we'll say, set up 10 commands a day with the easiest ones first and work your way up. And we're gonna have practice sessions to do that, kind of like batting practice. We actually call it compliance practice. So we'll say, hand me that banana, throw away that tissue. And if the child complies right away, we do verbal praise and we do high fives and awesome job, thank you for listening. And then we go right in with that momentum to the next one and we build our way up. If the child doesn't comply, we give them one warning. We say, you need to hand me that banana or you're gonna go to timeout for not listening. And we always add that on because we want them to understand the timeout is really for not listening and not whatever may or may not have happened with the banana. Um, and then if they still, if they comply with the warning, then we praise it as if it happened the first time. Thank you for turning it around. I appreciate that banana. Good job. Woo. Yay. Way to go. If they don't comply, we send them to timeout. Go to timeout for not listening. They go sit in timeout. Come back out of timeout. Now hand me that banana. So it's a way that you can do an immediate feedback, immediate consequence as a teaching tool during massed practice, right? Massed practice for compliance. Um, <laughs> Um, again, I noted here, be sure that you understand the function of the behavior before you use timeout um, so that you're not fitting right into the escape activity. When we move, uh, so some classrooms, can you, how many of you have classrooms where you can use timeout? Okay. Um, Head Start is not allowed to. Head Start does not believe in timeouts. So they can't use timeouts in their settings, um, which makes it kind of tricky, right? Um, and some school systems do not allow use of timeouts because they philosophically don't agree with them. Um, other schools have things that are more formalized like recovery rooms. Um, recovery rooms are essentially timeout rooms. Um, but there are things that, that you need to consider because the same, the same flaw, you can run into the same problems in a recovery room, which is kind of what Anitra was talking about earlier. If a recovery room is where a child is sent because their behavior becomes so disruptive they can't be maintained in the classroom, but they go sit in the recovery room with a paraprofessional who talks to them in a very nice way for the next hour and a half, 
that's not going to be a particularly, I mean, all that's really going to do is get them out of the teacher's hair for that hour and a half. It's not going to be a good intervention for the problem behavior because it's going to provide a steady dose of one-on-one -on -one attention contingent upon a problem behavior. So task demands need to follow to avoid it being simply an escape from task. If there are not tasks to be completed, some should be provided in the recovery room. Um, if kids are in the recovery room, it's so important to limit that high-intensity one-on-one attention until the recovery room period is over. When we have kids that we know are seeking attention by negative behaviors, we don't, it's not that we want to ignore that, right? We just want to file it away for a little bit, and we want to attend to it just not right there. So years and years ago, um, I work a lot with, because, because I myself am a foster parent and a parent of an adopted child, I work a lot with foster families. And a lot of foster kids are diagnosed with what? Attachment Reactive disorder. attachment disorder, which has a lot of really extreme behaviors in it. And I worked with a family whose therapist in another state had told them, when your child kicks you in the stomach like she just did, that is just her way of letting you know that she needs your love and attention more than ever. So what I want you to do is wrap her up in your arms and just hold her tight until that moment passes. Now, I don't know that child anymore, and I don't know that therapist, but what I do know is that from a behavioral perspective, that concerns me. <laughs> because what is happening there is we're providing what that child needs contingent upon aggression. So we're teaching that child that the way to obtain that is to be physically aggressive. And again, there's nobody but a mom who's gonna respond in that particular way. So my concern is we have to understand the function of the behavior. And if we think it is an extreme behavior that's driven by a need for attention and affection, we give it. We just don't give it right then. Um, try to avoid verbal processing of events or choices until after the behavior has corrected. So again, part of the timeout itself should not be a verbal processing. You might do the verbal processing, but do it later when the behavior has corrected. So you have a you have a aggressive, out of control child. They go to timeout. Um, the behavior has calmed. It's a little bit later. Then you sit down and process it, but you don't do it in the timeout or on the heels of the timeout.